Hey guys, it is such a beautiful day today. Oh my goodness. So if you hear like a weed whacker out there, I am sorry, the window is open. This past submission was really scary and it was really crazy. Um, and I did not update Fearless in terms of my plan of care and um, the medical parts that were going on because it was just really scary and complicated and we really weren't sure which way things were going to go. So now that I'm out of the hospital and our plan of care is established, I am, you know, more than willing to update you guys and keep you in the loop as to medically where we're at. I have a history of what is called hypercarbia or hypercapnia, which is carbon dioxide retention. The reason why my body retains carbon dioxide is because since my lungs just do not work right and are progressively in end stage, um, when I sleep at night, they don't like to work. They're just really tired and they don't like to fully expand and contract. So when I breathe, I breathe really, really shallow, like kind of like that. And um, so I'm, I'm obviously on my oxygen all night, so I'm getting enough oxygen, and, but I'm not exhaling and I'm not expelling the carbon dioxide. So I'm still breathing, but that carbon dioxide is just building up into my bloodstream um, and uh, you know that can basically poison your blood and your body can go into renal failure and you can die from that. Now don't worry because I'm not going to die and I'm not going to stop breathing, but it is a very critical situation and I had two admissions last year for those of you who were around um, in June when I was actually found unconscious and in December when I was put in the ICU on a BiPAP for like three or four days straight and it was not fun. Since my December admission I was discharged on the BiPAP at home to help with the CO2 and I've been doing fine with that ever since. I wear it at night when I sleep. Um, if you guys are interested in learning more about the BiPAP I can make a video and show you the BiPAP and what it does and that kind of stuff. For me one of the biggest symptoms of CO2 retention is called a retention headache. I don't know if medically like, that's what it's called but I call it that and you only ever wake up with it so I never get it like in the middle of the day I'll wake up with it sometimes and it's it, medically it's compared to like a severe migraine where you wake up and it's just it's sometimes the pain is actually what wakes you up it's so painful and you kind of just have to lay there um, and just let it do its thing because if you try to move, like you can't move. I couldn't even like roll over in my bed and reach my Tylenol that was on my nightstand. It was that bad. And you have to close your eyes and you like can't even roll your eyes or move your eyes because the muscles like behind your eyes, forgive my horrible explaining, it's just very painful. And the other thing that sucks too is that you can't sleep it off because it's caused by buildup of CO2 when you sleep that you can't just be like, oh, this is excruciating and go back to sleep and then wake up and have it be gone. Because as long as you're sleeping, it's going to be there. So the way to get rid of it is to wake up, to start moving. And as you're awake and as your body is starting to exhale and get rid of the carbon dioxide, then your levels will go down and the headache will go away. The weekend before I was admitted, I had like four or five mornings where I was waking up with retention headaches and I was like this is not good this is what I was having in December it's a very um, specific pain so I called up the clinic and I said hey I need to come in and have what's called an ABG which is an arterial blood gas and what they do is they stick um, a really really um, thin deep needle into your wrist um, into like where your pulse is they hit the tap into the artery and they draw that blood out and then from their arterial blood they can see where your carbon dioxide levels are. But we were at transplant support group and the CF nurse um, was like yeah just come up when you're done because I didn't have an appointment and so after support group we just made our way up to clinic and an RT came and did an ABG and she's like alright just chill here wait for the doctor to come back and um, he'll review your levels and let you know like you know what the deal is. So he comes in not more than 15 minutes later and he's basically like looking at me like and I'm like what and he's like uh 
like based on where your CO2 levels are, it's pretty alarming that you're not like in an unconscious, incoherent state right now. He said we need to immediately admit you to the ICU and get these CO2 levels under control. So here's a fun fact. <laughs> because per CF is so progressive, um, and it's slowly, slowly, slowly progressing. Um, basically, my body has been doing this and having this CO2 retention for months and months and months, if not years. I could have been doing it a long time before I ever thought I was, but just not having any symptoms. So because of that, my kidneys um, are like rock star kidneys and they um, compensate. So the reason why you're you risk having renal failure is because the CO2 levels are so toxic they poison the blood. However, my kidneys like filter my blood like crazy and get rid of the CO2 at an alarmingly awesome rate. Um, and so my bicarb levels in my blood should be here when my CO2 is here, but because my CO2 is here and I compensate so well, my bicarb is way down here. So in a way that's really cool, but it's also pretty weird. My blood is not um, acidically toxic with CO2, even though it should be. Again, thank you Lord. So I spent um, the first like five days of that admission just with the palm team and the med team consulting, um, adjusting and titrating the settings on the BiPAP to increase them to try to get me to a point where I could tolerate the BiPAP um, and hopefully my CO2 levels would respond. They were taking arterial and venous blood gases, which a venous blood gas is, um, they take it off the port. And it's not quite as accurate as an ABG, but it gives them a relatively close idea of what your, your CO2 is without having to poke your wrist. So they were drawing the levels in the evening and then in the early, early morning when I was still asleep and comparing them and they were like, wow, your evening CO2 level is basically normal for you it's within a normal range high for a normal person but for someone with CF that's an acceptable number but then in the morning and when I'm sleeping it's off the charts and so during the day when I'm awake my respirations are increased my heart rate is increased and essentially I'm blowing off the carbon dioxide a hospital pressure BiPAP is like this giant piece of industrial equipment and the air pressure is so intense that most like human beings cannot tolerate the level of pressure that their lungs require. I'm gonna get a little bit TMI right here, but um, I tried a, like I tried two attempted nights on a very very high setting, like the highest setting because they're like clearly you know your CO2 levels are not responding and you you know so we gotta up the pressure. It is like sticking your head out of the sunroof of a car at like 40 miles an hour trying to breathe. Like, if you have a, su a car with a sunroof, seriously, go try that. Like, have some fun with it and see what it feels like. It forces you to inhale and exhale on its schedule. So you're, you can't just naturally breathe. It, it, like, forces you to breathe at specific times and prolong your exhale and prolong your inhale. So these high, high pressures, um, it, it gets my heart racing. It's, like, impossible to fall asleep. It's very uncomfortable. And by the time you fall asleep, I would wake up not more than like an hour later with this severe nausea. Uh, it would like jolt me awake and I would feel like I'm about to throw up right now. And I would just rip the mask off and I would literally just be burping all of this air for like two minutes straight. I mean, you could feel the air just like rupturing out of you. Like your abdomen gets completely distended. It's very unpleasant. So they had to go down on the pressure to what I could tolerate. But after keeping an eye on that for a couple days and rechecking the VBGs, they were like, your CO2 is just not responding to the BiPAP like we were hoping. I was still getting those really, really high off the chart CO2 levels when I was asleep. And it was actually kind of funny because there was one night, uh, looking back, it's funny, that the medical team, because you know, Pulmonology is not their specialty field. I mean, they're the med team. So they looked at my, it was like at 2.30 a.m. VPG. I'd been asleep for like two hours. Within two hours, my CO2 skyrocketed. And they were like, I mean, they, they called the ICU team. They immediately, they almost coded me. They came in my room. They flipped on the lights. 
um, and they were like, you know, expecting to find like this unconscious person who needs to be like put on a ventilator like that. And I was like totally like coherent and I was like, I'm fine guys. I've been doing this for like months. I'm okay. Totally surprised those guys. So here's the bottom line, and I apologize because this is a pretty long vlog, but I want to give you guys all the details. Plan of care moving forward. There is nothing else they can do to um, kind of control these really, really high CO2s. The BiPAP is doing a little bit, but it's only doing so much. They're still getting really, really high in the night, um, but they can't do anything else. What it comes down to is obviously I need new lungs and as long as my body is compensating like this, I can continue like this until transplants. Now, if my body and my kidneys suddenly decide, hey, eh, I'm kind of tired of compensating on such a high level and um, if I start retaining during the day and suddenly I can't blow off the CO2, um, I'm having retention headaches like in the middle of the day or any other time that's not like just in the morning or I'm not able to just get rid of the headache. Um, if I have other symptoms and signs of CO2 retention such as um, it's kind of like being in this fog, like this extreme grogginess, um, I would compare it to like taking like half a bottle of Benadryl and then being shaken awake like three hours later and being told to drive a car in the middle of the night. Like that kind of focus is required just to like try to comprehend what someone's trying to tell you. If that kind of gives you a pretty good picture. Not that I've actually done that. So it's just really like this like almost sedated kind of stage, just very tired um, and just, anyway. So if I start showing signs of daytime CO2 retention, then um, unfortunately, the automatic, okay, plan of care is um, I go straight to the emergency department, I get put on a ventilator, and I will be put on what is called ECMO. And it stands for, um, I don't know, it's for something really long medically, but it's ECMO. And what it is, is basically the most advanced form of life support. It's like an iron lung in the sense that um, almost like a really critical form of kidney dialysis. Um, what they do is they go in surgically, tie off your carotid artery, they hook you up to this big like catheter tube, and then they filter all of your blood through this huge machine um, that oxygenates it and takes out the CO2 so that your lungs don't even have to work. Because really at that point they're just not able to keep the organs and your kidneys alive. In addition to the fact that ECMO is obviously no joke, and it's super critical. Um, the thing about it that like sucks is um, you don't, like you're fully sedated. Like you are in the ICU, um, it, like hooked up to every machine in the world and um, you don't come off of that until, unless you get new lungs, basically. Like it's, it's only for people who are in like either heart or lung end stage awaiting transplant. So I would not wake up from ECMO and I would not walk out of the hospital until after I've had transplant. And we don't know how long that could be. Um, so it's like saying goodnight to the world. Just realizing how dark it's getting, I'm sorry. I didn't notice that till now and this light isn't even working. So I'm gonna wrap things up here, but um, yeah, so we don't, we don't want to ECMO, obviously. Basically, one of the two is gonna come first. Either I'm gonna get the call for transplant, no problem, um, or, you know, I can wake up tomorrow and my body could be like, I can't fight off this CO2, um, I'm not gonna blow it off, I can't compensate, and it would be like, uh, like I said, like, good night world. I just want you guys to know that I'm in good spirits, Absolutely. I believe that, you know, the call is going to come and I'm going to get those new lungs. Um, hi, Levi. Hi, buddy. Can you even see? Oh. Um, but at the same time, we don't know. Nothing is for certain. And um, so I'm really just appreciating every single day that I have. Not that I wasn't before, but now I'm like, okay. Um, that's where things are at. So... 
again, thank you guys for the love, the prayers, the support, and, um, you know, I'll just keep making these videos and keep keeping you guys up to date because it's great. Um, I have fun doing it, and, um, that's about it, so. Have a great week. Enjoy the sun.